Today we're going to be looking at A Soldier by Robert Frost and I just want to preface this analysis by saying how hard I found this poem to study because I think it has such far-reaching implications and it's made me realise that in some ways longer poems are easier to study because they have more opportunity to get into specifics. So I would definitely say if this is your first Robert Frost poem then go look at another one. Um, Or at least don't judge him by this one poem because I really think this is very different to most of his other poems, which we will discuss a bit more later on. Firstly, I want to talk about some of the key subjects explored in this poem. So some of these you could describe as themes, but some of them you couldn't. It's more just the things that make up this poem, if that makes sense. So... If I had to describe this poem in one word, I would say that it's about sacrifice, but kind of expanding off from that, it's also about the wider subjects of death and war and paying respects to people who sacrifice themselves. It also sort of explores the perspective from which we view these things. So it discusses our humanity compared to spirituality, uh, and this brings up subjects of objectivity which kind of goes into some of the perspectives I think are characteristic of modernism, perhaps in opposition to romanticism, uh, but we'll discuss all that a bit more later on. There's also an underlying exploration of faith and philosophical thought and this kind of belief in a higher power. And finally, it's written in a sonnet form, which is important as well. So what is the story that this poem tells? Well, it's about a soldier who has died, but the interesting thing is that we don't look at him explicitly. He is actually represented by his weapon, and I think that weapon, which is kind of a spear, represents soldiers in general, and this spear is still in the ground in the position it was thrown there in. So the general public look at this weapon and at the lives of soldiers, as pointless and unfinished. But what Robert Frost is pointing out is that what we don't realise is that being only human, we can't actually comprehend the higher purposes that soldiers die for. But when they sacrifice themselves, their spirits are rewarded for fulfilling this higher purpose by going to heaven. So you can probably already tell that this is a really deep poem and It's just a really hard one to kind of wrap your head around, Um, but I'm going to try and break it down a little bit. So I think that this poem is sort of split into three sections. So lines one to three outline how most people see soldiers' lives. They see them merely as a dead body, which has fallen for no reason. But lines four to eleven kind of start to rethink this and... Frost starts to evaluate this perspective and how it might be biased or we might not understand what we're judging. And then in lines 12 to 14, he offers an alternative and a more peaceful and objective conclusion. Now to break it down even further, we're going to look at it line by line. So let's start with the title, A Soldier. So this immediately establishes that this is a poem about the sacrifice of the soldier rather than the really broad concept of war in general. And you'll notice that a soldier is quite ambiguous, not like the soldier. It could be referring to any soldier and I think that this is deliberate. Our first impression of this ambiguity might be that this soldier has been forgotten and he just he's disregarded as just another weapon in warfare. However, I think that Frost's intention with the poem, and therefore with this title, was to make us rethink this dismissal, and instead he's using this ambiguity to supersize the soldier into something larger than the individual, so that his sacrifice is actually more important than the war in which it took place. And I think this is to make the point that all soldiers' sacrifice is actually more important than the wars which they were in when they sacrificed themselves. He is that fallen lance that lies as hurled, that lies unlifted now, 
come dew, come rust, but still lies pointed as it ploughed the dust. So as I said above, these lines start off the poem with how average citizens tend to see soldiers. So Frost describes their opinion through an extended metaphor of the lance, which represents the soldier. Already we're getting the impression that he's critiquing this popular opinion, because when it's framed like this, the soldier's weapon seems more important than his life. And I think this is really clever because it makes it obvious to the reader that we have our priorities wrong, because obviously a human life is more important than the weapon that he threw. So the mention of rust tells us that the body has been there a long time, and the repetition in come do, come rust emphasizes this as the rhythm mirrors the passage of time. And I think this implies that we might have forgotten the soldier or we are somehow at a distance from him. People imagine the lance was thrown to plow the dust, which again shows how far from the truth our perception has come and how pointless we've come to see this very meaningful act as. Um, and it does this because dust is infertile, so plowing it, as farmers do, won't accomplish anything. And in this way, we imagine that the soldier's death didn't accomplish anything. If we who sight along it round the world see nothing worthy to have been its mark, it is because, like men, we look too near, forgetting that as fitted to the sphere, our missiles always make too short an arc. In these lines, the tone shifts to a slightly more thoughtful one as Frost starts to analyse our thought patterns. And for me, these are the most difficult lines of the poem to interpret. And you're going to have to bear with me because it's kind of quite spiritual and deep um, what I've yeah come up with as an explanation for this. Uh, but let's get into it. Yeah, so the average citizen, Frost is saying, is short-sighted. He says, we look too near. And this means we cannot imagine the great mission of the soldier. We see nothing worthy to have been its mark. Fitted to the sphere has a double meaning. In the literal sense, it relates to gravity restricting the missile's throw. But spiritually, it means we're only humans. And the missiles kind of represent our acts. So as humans who are stuck on Earth... Our territory is down on the ground and that's kind of as far as we can achieve, unlike gods or, you know, higher powers who live in the sky. So the result of this limited perspective that we have is that people who hear of war on a macro scale kind of look at the spoils of it and think, what even is the point of sacrificing yourself and that kind of thing? And we do this because we forget that the soldier was aiming towards a higher purpose that we cannot comprehend. Being just mortals who are still on earth, we kind of don't understand these deeper meanings. Whereas in death and in the kind of transportation of the spirit towards a higher plane, we are able to fulfill this deeper purpose that we cannot do while we're stuck on Earth. So I think that Robert Frost is touching on this idea that peace can't just be imagined and agreed through conversations between countries. Sometimes it must be paid for, and sometimes that payment has to be blood. Perhaps some big changes can only be achieved through dying for them. They fall. They rip the grass, they intersect the curve of earth, and striking, break their own. They make us cringe for metal point on stone. These three lines outline how unpleasant war seems to us. We cringe away from thinking about it. This is demonstrated through striking and break, which are violent words with harsh consonants. And this conveys the tragic destruction of war. Uh, there's also listing and repetition of they, which ups the pace and therefore the urgency. And I think that Break Their Own demonstrates kind of the inevitable destruction and perhaps even self-destruction of war. But this we know. The obstacle that checked and tripped the body 
shot the spirit on, further than target ever showed or shone. These final three lines offer a more peaceful conclusion, and they end with a rhyming couplet and alliteration for emphasis of this alternative message. So trip to the body is referring to physical death, and I think the message here is that death is when we leave the body behind and as a spirit go on to heaven, further than those back on earth can ever imagine. Therefore, the target represents our imagination, the imagination of the mortals still on earth. Then there's a really cool bit of imagery here of a person falling to their death and the earth stopping the fall of their body, but it actually propels their spirit into heaven. Okay, let's take a break from some of this deep philosophical thought and look at the form of the poem. So this poem is a sonnet and that means it has an A, B, B, A rhyming scheme. There's 10 syllables per line. It's written in iambic pentameter. There's also 14 lines. Didn't mention that, I don't think. Another thing related to the form of the poem is the perspective that it's written in. So this is written in first person plural, as in we, um, which emphasizes the philosophical tone because the narrator is speaking not as an individual, but for the entire human race. Now let's look at the literary devices used in the poem. So the biggest and most obvious one would be the extended metaphor of the lance for the fallen soldier. So this lance will rot away and be forgotten, just as the body will. But Frost presents this concept as rusting metal rather than a bloody body because it makes it less personal and it allows us to understand the concept of war in a more objective way. World War I had just taken place when this poem was published, so I think that distancing the subject of this poem from contemporary happenings in this way meant that people could kind of put aside their memories of the war and perspectives that they'd heard on World War I specifically and just not get entangled in all that and instead think about war as an abstract concept. And another thing that helps out with this is that the weapon that is used to represent the soldier is an ageless weapon, pretty much, you know? Or at least it's not one that is associated with the recent conflicts. If it had been a gun or something associated with World War I, or that they would have used in World War I, people might become biased in their thought. So I think there's definitely a lot of intention here in how Frost has framed this discussion. As well as this, there is repetition in come dew, come rust, which implies the passage of time, which represents how far our perceptions of sacrifice are from the truth of sacrifice. Then there's a sort of contradiction in the phrase plowed the dust, since dust is infertile and it can't be plowed. So this is striking out of its ridiculousness, really. And so this serves as emphasis for how pointless the soldier's death seems to us. Striking and break are violent words with harsh consonants conveying the tragic destruction of war. And there's the listing and re repetition of they in the middle of the poem, which ups the pace and the urgency. I've covered all this already, but just thought I would try and drill it into your head. Then finally, there's the rhyming couplet at the end. And there's also alliteration at the end of showed and shone. And there's imagery of the spirit being propelled somewhere greater. All of which cements the final declaration in our minds. Now let's discuss tone a little bit. So I think this poem has a very respectful and remorseful tone. And that's sort of established through the quite slow pace of most of the poem. There is very long sentences and there's not many harsh consonants. Obviously lines 9 to 11 are exceptions to this rule. There's a lot of harsh consonants there and there's a lot of sort of pauses for breath which ups the pace. But in general it does seem to be just paying respect to fallen soldiers and honouring their sacrifice. 
in this very sad and sombre tone of voice. I also think it's worth pointing out that Robert Frost rarely sticks to strict poem forms, but the beauty of the sonnet form, which is often used to write about love, shows how much genuine emotion and worth he associates with this topic. He's made the effort to stick to quite a strict poetic form to, yeah, display just how much he thinks this topic is worth thinking about and the beauty of this topic is worth displaying. And I think this plays into how his approach to this really sensitive topic is very delicately handled. He puts an optimistic and faithful spin on this tragic event, but he doesn't do it to the point of being idealistic. He balances the romanticism of being a soldier by emphasizing the fact that this great duty comes at a very heavy price. So speaking of romanticism, I think this shows how this poem is an example of modernism, which actually arose in opposition to romanticism. So if you're not familiar with these terms, this is a very basic um, definition, but I'm just going to list a couple of words that are related to them. So modernism emphasizes objectivity, universality, realism, and analytical thinking, whereas romanticism emphasizes the individual, emotion, etc, etc. So I should discuss these a little more in future, um, but that is the basics. Uh, so yeah, I think that this is a modernism poem. He's trying to pay respect to his emotions, but not get caught up in them and appreciate that there is something bigger at play. I feel like romanticism is very inward focused and yeah, this is quite outward focused and saying that there are maybe objective truths that are more important than emotion and that is definitely not a romanticist strain of thought. And a final word on tone. Uh, I think this has a very spiritual and philosophical tone, which hopefully you've gathered already from all the discussion we've been doing, uh, but it's laced with a firm belief which produces an optimism which I think is really unusual for Frost and it's quite an interesting thing to notice. We are almost done, but I did want to address a couple of the things that crossed my head while studying this poem uh, related to Robert Frost as a person. So, for one thing, is this poem religious? Um, it is a very philosophical poem. There's a lot of talk of spirituality and that kind of thing. So, Robert Frost never fully embraced religion, but he was influenced by Christian writings. So, I've been talking a lot about heaven and stuff like that in this video, um, because I suppose me living in Britain, I'm also influenced by Christian concepts. Um, but in the poem, he never says any of that explicitly. He never talks about heaven or about Christ or, you know, refers to any kind of religious terms. Instead, he just talks about believing in a higher purpose and a reward for the spirit or for the soul if that higher purpose is fulfilled. But these, yeah, again, are not necessarily Christian principles or even religious principles. So I think what Robert Frost was trying to do was make this message applicable no matter what your beliefs were. Yeah, he's just putting forward this very broad message, which then you can apply to your own life according to your own perspective and beliefs. Another question that I had was, is this poem pro-war? And I definitely think that this poem could be interpreted as encouraging war. But in general, it's more just talking about sacrificing for something greater than yourself. So we could say the soldier is sacrificing himself to further peace. Again, Frost makes a point not to allude to any particular event or individual, or in this case, war. Therefore, I think that he's just trying to demonstrate this point about sacrifice as an abstract concept through a not abstract concept that most of us will recognize, which is a soldier dying in war. Um, and of course, especially his contemporary readers would recognize this metaphor 
for his message because obviously they had just gone through World War One. But yeah, I think it's really interesting to think about it like this, that this poem might not even be about war at all, at least not necessarily. Uh, it might not even be about a soldier. It's just that the soldier represents sacrifice. It all comes back to <laughs> sacrifice. And the image of the soldier and of the war and of the weapon are all just metaphors to further this point. I'm going to end this analysis by talking about how this poem is different to conventional Frost poems. So usually, Frost will focus on a personal, intimate event or concept, such as we've covered picking apples, mending a wall, swinging on birch trees, but this is deliberately not set in any particular character, setting, or time. Instead, it focuses on abstract and general concepts, such as sacrifice, war, and purpose, through an impersonal voice representing the entire human race. And as I've touched upon earlier in this analysis, I think that's why this poem feels, at least to me, quite inaccessible, because it's just so broad, you know? Frost usually will make his philosophical musings more accessible by putting them in terms of everyday life or representing them with an event. So to put this in romanticist or modernist terms, I might say that he usually writes about modernist themes like urbanization and loss of the individual, uh, objectivity, but from a romanticist perspective, because he's often quite reluctant to embrace contemporary society. Whereas in this poem, he does seem to be going more towards a modernist perspective. He seems to have had a realisation that transcends human emotion and imagination, which is what romanticism is all about. But again, I'm definitely going to research more about romanticism and modernism in future and discuss those a lot more in my future videos, hopefully. <laughs> so other ways in which this is different from usual Frost poems, I think can actually all be drawn back to this sort of shift in perspective. Um, it's written in a traditional strict poem structure, the sonnet. The well-known beauty of this form and its association with love might be Frost's way of paying tribute to the honour of soldiers. Also, he begins by clearly stating what the poem alludes to, and he ends on a declarative note about knowledge, which is really unusual because he usually guides his poems using underlying emotions, and if there is some kind of declaration, yeah, it'll be about emotion. And finally, this poem takes quite a positive and trustingly faithful approach, though there are still hints of regret and bitterness, I think, about sort of the conventional perspective where he's often very pessimistic um, and quite confused about his thoughts um, especially about religion I think and perspective whereas in this poem he seems to have it all sorted out he's sort of like yeah we should believe in higher purposes that's the truth and our emotions don't really matter, uh, whereas usually, yeah, he's so focused on his emotions. So yeah, though this is very different to usual Frost poems, I think it potentially could say a lot about him.